I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Because there in the house of the Lord is the Lord and his people, and it is a great joy and honor to be with you here this morning. I'm going to ask those who are designated to take the offering if they would come and do so at this time. For the rest of you, would you take your copy of God's word and meet me in Genesis chapter 15. And as you turn to Genesis chapter 15, I want to put a couple of things before you this morning. We're going to, I'm going to give you some announcements and then uh, we're going to pray. First of all, really exciting news coming out of our FSM camp this afternoon at the Germantown Outpost. From noon until whenever, because it's going to be lit, I mean lo- noon until three or so, um, man, we're, FSM is kicking off the semester. They're kicking off their year this afternoon at the Germantown Outpost. They're encouraging all of the FSMers, all family, middle, high school, come out to the Germantown Outpost. Um, there's going to be food, there's going to be games, fun, um, and you'll, you, you'll definitely don't want to miss it. Uh, Our FSM staff are going to be given kind of an overview of where they're heading this semester and this year, and so I want to commend that to you. We praise God for what they do for our uh, children because the church is not only this generation but the ones to come. And so we're grateful for the work of Brian, Crenshaw, and Shelley. This afternoon, uh, immediately following this service, uh, by immediately, I mean later on tonight at 515, uh, will be our first DNA group. Uh, DNA, these DNA groups are a new group that we have here at Fellowship where if you're coming and you want to learn more about our church, you want to know what makes us tick, you want to look under the hood, as it were, then these DNA groups are a perfect opportunity for you to come. They're short, so they're only about four weeks, but it's going to be from 515 tonight until 645. There will be child care provided. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So if you're interested and you want to learn a little bit more about what we do here at Fellowship, about what our church is about, or you're new to our church and you're like, hey, I like what goes on on Sunday mornings, but I really want to know uh, holistically what Fellowship is about, then that DNA group is for you. If you want to go to that today, because resources are limited and because we can't have everybody and their mama trying to be up in that thing eating, I need you to RSVP to Pastor Mo. Mo, where are you at? Are you in here? Mo's in the back. He's going to be in the back, and so if you want to go, uh, go holler at, at Pastor Mo and let him know that you're going to be coming. Well, this morning, before we hop into the text, one more announcement, and then we're going to pray. Maybe this morning, this is your first time with us. You're a guest with us this morning. I just want to say welcome. We are so grateful that you've taken the time to come and see us. And to show our gratitude, we'd love to have lunch with you today. So immediately following this service, straight down the hall, Take the first right, you'll head down there, you'll see a big old sign that says guest lunch. We'd love to spend a few moments just hearing from you, hearing how you came to know us, how you came to see us. We'd love to be able to know how to pray for you, uh, and we'd love to tell you a little bit more about us. So if you're a guest, I commend that to you, so please come and see us uh, today. Well, as we speak, Hurricane Irma is making landfall on the United States, and there are Many of you this morning who have family in Florida, I know my in-laws are in Florida, they're, uh, they're riding out the storm, and I know that millions others have been displaced. And there's a lot of talk in these days that people want to point to, you know, signs of the apocalypse, or people want to make irrational statements concerning the origins of this storm. But the truth remains that there are people who need our prayer. There's an entire state that needs our prayer. And so what I'd like for us to do before we hop into God's word this morning is I want us to pray. Pray for that state, pray for those people, pray for our brothers and sisters, and pray that with the same vigor and fervor that people mobilized for Hurricane Harvey, they would do the same thing for Irma. So would you join me as we go to the Lord in prayer? Father, this morning we have many of our friends and family members who are in the shadow of death. They are those who even right now have the threat of life and land up in the air. And Lord, we need you. They need you. Father, this morning I pray for those who have lost loved ones in this storm and pray that somehow you would take 
a tragedy and turn it into triumph, ultimately for your glory and their good. For those who've lost property, those who've lost their homes, Father, I pray that not only would you remind them that our true home is in heaven, but God, that you would restore unto them those things which have been lost. And Father, even in the wake of a storm like this, there is great fear and uncertainty in Jesus. I pray that you would be the hope, the true hope that we would cling to in this time. And so, Father, we don't know why a lot of things happen. And we can't explain it all, but God, we trust that there's a good reason, there's a good plan. We trust that you have everything under control. And so, Father, we do ask for your help, God, we pray for your mercy in this storm, that you would allow it to cease in its strength. And ultimately, Father, would you carry all of those in harm's way to safety, we pray. Amen. Amen. Genesis chapter 15. This morning, we're going to begin in verse 1. I have the wonderful opportunity to introduce us and open up a new sermon series this morning. A sermon series, as you've seen entitled The Gospel of Exodus. And in order to open a sermon series on Exodus, let's read Genesis chapter 15, verse 1. Verse 1 reads, After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord and counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of, from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer, three years old, a female goat, three years old, a ram, three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought them all, he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half, and when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. But... I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterwards they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. This is the word of the Lord. Before considering it, we should pray, so let's pray. Holy Spirit, you've pinned the words on this page. You've been the one who've inspired them. Guide us this morning, I ask and I plead. It's in your name, Jesus, we pray, amen. Amen. Every promise of God finds its yes and amen in Jesus Christ. Meaning, Jesus himself fulfills all things in and of himself. Throughout the Old Testament, we see themes and we see motifs. We see themes of rest, of peace, of victory, of freedom, even of emancipation. And in each of these themes and more, their truest fulfillment and expression is found in Jesus Christ. The Old Testament is full of types and shadows. Characters, events, even miracles that are meant to point us to their greater complement. They are but shadows of the true focus of these people and 
events, shadows. Perhaps you've heard of Punxsutawney Phil, who every February the world watches on, to which I still don't know why, to determine if that little groundhog were to see his shadow, for if he does, then that means that we've got an extended amount of winter. If he doesn't, then we don't. And there's superstition wrapped to that. But the shadow of Punxsutawney Phil is just as famous as he is. How many of us have remembered Peter Pan from being children? And the ongoing battle that Peter has in trying to free himself from his own shadow. I can remember being a kid and the heat of the day in Alabama when it's 110 degrees outside and ain't nothing outside but tears, death, and mosquitoes, I can remember trying to rid myself of my own shadow. I couldn't run fast enough. I could not jump high enough. No matter where I went, I always had one. And then even in horror movies, those things some of you pay good money to be afraid, I refuse to waste such money. But there in the movie, it's the shadow of a figure that brings as much horror and fear as the one who's projecting it. Why? Because the shadows mean that there's something bigger coming. In the Old Testament, we get types and shadows. After all, what is a shadow? Is it not but a one-dimensional, partial version of the real object? And who among, who among us, gazing at a shadow, can declare that once seeing a shadow, they've now seen the epitome of beauty? I've seen the most beautiful of all things. <laughs> no one. No one looks at a shadow and says, this is the end of the story. No one looks at a shadow and says, this is as good as it gets. Everyone looks at a shadow and says, what's casting it? When we come to Exodus, when we come to the Old Testament, it is Jesus Christ that casts the shadow. And Exodus and other types and shadows of the Old Testament stand in the darkness as a signpost that points us to the greater one because it's when we see these characters, these events, and these miracles that we get glimpses of his glory that point our gaze to what's ahead. So why Genesis? Why Genesis to open up a series on Exodus? Because I'm a firm believer that in order to know where you're going, you got to know where you've been. One of the greatest detriments to my soul is the modern day loss of a sense of history. I was once having a conversation with a young man that I mentored and I asked him if he knew who Martin Luther King Jr. was. He said, yeah, I know him. He had a dream. And then I asked him if he knew who A. Philip Randolph was, who Bayard Rustin was, who Fred Shuttlesworth was, and I may as well have been speaking in tongues to this young man. He had no idea about history. He had no idea about his ancestors. If we do not look at where we've been, we have no idea where we're going. And so what I hope to do here in Genesis is to give us a history of Israel and how we get to Exodus. How do we get to the gospel of Exodus, the good news as it were? In order to get there, we've got to start at the beginning. In the beginning, God created, right? The first lines that open up the Bible. To to start off the Bible with in the beginning, God presupposes that there's an end. Why would you write in the beginning if you weren't expecting there to be an end to this? So right at the beginning, we get the signal that this whole book is about God who pre-exists everything. He's not created, but he pre-exists and he reigns sovereign over all the universe. We go from God to a man and a woman naked in the garden of Eden in a covenant, Adam and Eve in a covenant with God. That God mediates his relationship with them through their covenant. And after the fall, we 
walk through a period of time where humankind declines further into sin. You want to know what it's like, what it was like right before God sent a flood on the earth? Go to any comment section or message board on the internet. That's what it was like. And so God sends his floods upon the earth, casting a great judgment on all the earth, killing everybody except for Noah and his family. He makes a covenant with Noah there, and he says, never again will I flood this earth by water. He won't flood the earth by water, but there's coming a time where he's going to bring fire. And from Abraham, or excuse me, from Noah, we go to this man, Abram. Now, I like Abram. He's a man of great resources. He's a man of great wealth. But Abraham is a pagan. He is lost. He has a perfunctory understanding of who God is, but he doesn't know who God is. And God comes to Abram one day, and he rocks his world. He says, hey, look, I'm getting ready to do something great in you. I'm getting ready to bless you. I'm going to give you a land. I'm going to give you protection. I'm going to give you peace. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to give you a son. Abraham's like, wait a minute. Come on, God. <laughs> you going to give me a son? Do you not know that I'm way past childbirthing years? And my wife, Sarah, she's barren. Her womb is a tomb. And yet God, here in Genesis 15, reiterates, he re-ups his covenant with Abraham, and he says, I'm going to give you a son. Now watch this. I get the question all the time, how were Old Testament saints saved? We're talking about the gospel of Exodus, and here I want to show you the gospel that's even in Genesis, the good news of Genesis. Look with me in Genesis 15. In verse 5, God brings him outside. He says, look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number him. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Here's the gospel. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. Now watch this. How were Old Testament saints and believers saved? Answer, the same way that you and I are saved. Meaning, we are saved by placing faith in the seed of God. Here we get the foreshadowing of one who would come who would be of the lineage of Abraham, and yet through that one seed, all of the nations might be blessed. God promises Abraham not only a son, but he promises him national blessing. And here we see Abraham as a man of faith. Here we see Abraham being the father of faith. Here we see Abraham being saved. And after Abraham, he would give birth to Isaac. And after Isaac, there was Jacob. And Jacob had 12 sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Gad, Dan, Naphtali, Joseph, Benjamin, I'm missing a couple, Issachar, Zebulun, and Asher. And of those 12, one of those sons was Joseph. Now, Joseph was a runt, but God has a tendency of taking runts and making them royalty. And so what he does is he takes this young man, Joshua, he puts him through a very series a great series of unfortunate events, everything from being in the bottom of a well to uh, trying to be taken advantage of by a very powerful man's wife to being in prison and then into the house of the king. This is just a sermon for another time, but we must never write off those who are incarcerated because God can make them still do great things. This man, Joseph, though incarcerated, wrongfully so, God still uses prison to elevate him to where he's going to be. That's another sermon for another time, but we must take care of those who are in prison. That's why Jesus will later on say, when I was in prison, did you come to see me? Anyway, so we get to this point where we see this runt turning into a ruler, and he takes, God takes this man, Joseph, and he puts him in Pharaoh's house. And perhaps you've seen that old movie where Joseph, who's got that really bomb eye makeup on, is standing there before Pharaoh, and there's a drought in the land, and there's famine. And so his dad, in his old age, brings his brothers, and he's asking for food. And Joseph, they don't know who he is. And Joseph's like, hey, um, I will give this to you, but I want you to bring everybody. And oh, by the way, I'm going to keep Benjamin. Benjamin, your youngest son, whom you love, your youngest son, whom is your favorite son. I want to keep him so that you have to come back. And then... 
like an episode of Fixer Upper. When they come back to Pharaoh's household, it's there that Joseph reveals himself as being the son that they thought was dead, the brother they thought was dead. Now, why is this important? When we get to the book of Exodus, it's the story of God delivering a people out of bondage. Well, how did those people get into bondage? What happened was Joseph moved his entire family to Egypt. Before NFL and NBA players said, I'm buy my mama a house with my first check, Joseph says, hey, I'm pretty much running Egypt, so let me bring me and my whole people into this place. They think they original by doing that. No, Joseph did that first. And it was here in this place that all of Israel began to be settled, and it's here. After Jacob died, after Joseph died, after Pharaoh at the time died, that there was was there raised up another Pharaoh who said, these people are too numerous. If war were to break out, they would not be on our side. They could overthrow us. Now here, watch this. The most powerful kingdom in the world at that time, afraid of a little tiny people. And what do they do? In fear, they enslave them. And it's here that we find the people of God in bondage, in need of deliverance. What is the gospel of Exodus about? It is about a people in need of rescue. And God delivers his people to dwell with them. I'm going to say that one more time. You're going to hear this 50 11 times throughout this sermon series. And this is the thrust. This is the heart of Exodus that God delivers his people so that he might dwell with them. In other words, Exodus is about being delivered from peril, harm, and danger in order to dwell with God. This is the gospel in Exodus. These types And these shadows, they point us to the greater and the truer fulfillment that is found in Jesus. The good news is that God still rescues us from peril, harm, and danger. You see, Exodus may be about uh, people getting out of bondage, but it also lets us know that there is one that we're going to be bound to even stronger than Pharaoh. And that is sin. And yet, just as God delivered his people out of Exodus, if the truer fulfillment of every type of shadow in the Old Testament is found in Jesus, then that means that Jesus Christ is our own personal exodus. That the way that we get out is in Christ. How did Noah and his family, how were they saved from the wrath of God? They were in the ark. How are we saved from harm, from peril, from danger? It is in Christ. Christ is the vehicle to freedom. He's a vehicle to emancipation. So, We see the gospel in Exodus is the same gospel we trust in. It's the gospel preached in Genesis. It is faith in the seed of God, which we know his name to be Jesus. And in light of all of this, Jesus, and I want you to hear me, Jesus brings deliverance holistically. He brings emotional deliverance. Deliverance from pain from suffering. He brings deliverance from mental illness. He brings that. Jesus brings deliverance from physical harm. Jesus brings deliverance from spiritual harm. Jesus is a bondage breaker. Hallelujah. And one of, the, one of my favorite things about God here in the book of Exodus As we continue to look at what Exodus is about, it is the foresight and the knowledge and the wisdom of God. Look in Genesis 15, verse 13. Abram has a bad dream, as it were. And it's within this dream he has a vision where God says, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and they will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for 400 years. Years, when I was growing up, there was a very famous psychic named Miss Cleo. And I remember staying up very late at night and listening and watching the ads from Miss Cleo, thinking if I could only call Miss Cleo, she could fix my life. But even Miss Cleo ain't got this kind of foresight. 
How can God look almost 2,000 years in the future and see something and make it plain to this brother? God's priming the pump, as it were, so that even when the sniff and the whiffs of oppression begin, these people have to say, well, God already said this is going to happen, and if God is the one who looks into the future and have memories, then it means that he's got us even now. You see, I like the fact that God is the one who in so many ways, despite what we think we know, he's always working something out on the back end because here's what he said. Notice what he says in verse 16. Why this time of oppression? He says, in the fourth generation they will come because the iniquity of the Amorites has not come to pass. Why is God waiting? He's waiting because he's going to deliver them into a land specifically for them, but it's not ready yet. One of my favorite, or excuse me, one of my biggest pet peeves is when I travel and I show up to a city early and I'm trying to get in my hotel early, but the check-in isn't until 3 or 4 o'clock. I get there at like 9 or 10. What am I supposed to do? Go hang out? Well, can I check in early? No, sir, you can't check in early. You have to wait till 3 o'clock. And then I just try to find something to do for the next four or five hours. And I end up reading a book in some weird place like a rental car or behind a restaurant somewhere. But there's a waiting because the room's not ready yet. Why does God send these people into oppression for 400 years? Among other reasons, it's because the land isn't ready. God's plans, though we may not understand them, are better than our own. So, what is Exodus really about? What is Exodus really about? The first thing that Exodus is about is it's about God. Exodus is about God. Exodus is about the one who makes nature and the laws of physics bend to his will. He turns the Nile into blood. He makes water come from a rock. He makes entire bodies of water stand on its head for him. Exodus is about the God who causes victory from unexpected places. There's a scene in Exodus 17 where, Exodus 18 rather, where the Israelites are fighting the Amalekites. There's a lot of these weird named people, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Amalekites. We can't even really pronounce their names. But what we need to know is that they serve as fodder for God to show his victory among all the nations. So in one particular battle, Israel's fighting against the Amalekites, and the battle gets heated. And God says, hey, Moses, if you raise your staff as long as it's raised, then the people, my people, will see victory. And so Moses raises his staff, and what happens? The people of Israel begin to triumph, and there's great winning. But Moses is just a man, and he starts to get that lactic acid burn in his shoulders, and his arm begins to fall. And what happens? Israel begins to lose. And so all of a sudden, you see Joshua and Aaron and Aaron's brother. You see him run up and hold Moses' arms up. And they hold his arms up through the rest of the day, and it's there that God causes victory on the battlefield. Is it really one man holding his arm up that causes an army to win? No. It is, those who are, it is those who are faithful and obedient to the word of God that find victory in their life and the life of their people. God is teaching something greater. God causes victory to come from unlikely circumstances. Exodus is about a God who is holy. He gives the law so that we might know that we never measure up to God's standards. The law is a mirror, as it were, to show us our wickedness. Why? So that we would always be relying on the grace of God. Why is the gospel in Exodus? Because the gospel is, you're not good enough, praise God, God is. God gives us, furthermore, he gives us the law to rely on his grace because Exodus is about a God who is worthy of praise. We read, the tab we read about the tabernacle, and many of us, when we read through the Bible in a year, we tend to skip over certain sections. I mean, nobody really reads Leviticus, but there's this long section in Exodus about the tabernacle with the basin and the altar of the bread and the altar of presence and the table and all these things. And we kind of glance over that, but Exodus is about a God who's worthy of praise. So why does God give us so many particular laws? And why does God give us very important, distinct, specific instructions for him to be 
have a house built. It's because God wants you and I to know that he is not to be worshipped like any other worldly God. He is wholly unique. He's wholly individual. He's holy worship of unique praise. This is why God writes up the plans, enlists the labor, and then does his own interior decorating in the tabernacle. God is not ordinary. Should not be worshipped as another false God. But ultimately, my friends, and I'm about to be finished. Exodus is ultimately, it's not about Moses or Pharaoh. It's not about golden calves or even the children of Israel. Exodus, like all scripture, is about God. A God who delights to deliver his children from bondage so that they might be with him and delight in his presence. Here's my question for you this morning, church. What do you need to be delivered from? What is standing in the way of your own intimacy with God? What is it that is standing between you and God? What kind of bondage or oppression are you under that you need to be delivered from? God is a God who loves his children. He doesn't place restraining orders against his children. He wants us to come to him. In fact, he delights when we're close to him. But we tend to place obstacles between us and him. What is that? Here in just a moment, we're going to pray. But I want you to know that God always delivers his people so that he can be close to them. The truth this morning is that he wants to be close to you. What's standing in the way? I want to say, I want to take a few minutes and I just want to uh, pray. Pray for you, pray for us. Pray that this series would be a series where God would reveal himself to us in powerful ways, in ways that would be atypical. Before we come to the table, maybe you would pray and ask God to reveal to you those things that are standing in the way, that are, have you in bondage, whatever that is. And pray that God would deliver you and us from them. Let's pray. Father, our hearts are incessant idol factories. They continually place things and elevate things higher than you. But God, the truth that we hold on to is that you've been preaching the good news of the gospel of your son even in Genesis. You've laid out a plan. Father, I ask that you would reveal to us those places in our life that we are not submitting to you. And Lord, I pray that it's in those moments of honesty and clarity that you would, from our weakness, deliver us, O oh Lord, out of bondage and into freedom. And would you begin that this morning as we come to the table to remember what you have done and look ahead to what you're going to do. It's in your name we pray. Amen.